Hello. When I left Norway on Monday morning, I had to walk through snow to get to the bus to get to the airport. Uh, and then when I arrived in Austin about 18 hours later, it was what we Norwegians call a really beautiful summer's day. And I thought I'd packed all the wrong clothes. And I thought I need to adapt to this. Turns out I didn't have to adapt at all. Austin adapted to me. Because yesterday it snowed in Austin. Probably my fault. I don't know. My name is Odun Ferkalstram. I work for the Norwegian Labor and Welfare Administration. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about how, oops, how I get this to work. Uh, uh, yeah. And today I'm going to talk about how, uh, by adopting Kubernetes in an old legacy system, legacy platforms, have been able to solve a lot of the problems we had as an organization. Uh, we were stuck on premise in our own data centers. We had way too many test environments. We had an access control which was too coarse, so it uh, was a problem for developers. We had network zones almost hindering any kind of development pace. We needed some kind of overview of all our dependencies that we could trust. We had really bad monitoring and observability in our systems. It was difficult and cumbersome to create new applications, and we had loads of nightly batch jobs. Uh, today, I'm first I'm going to talk a bit about NAV, the organization I work for, and then I'm going to go through all the problems I just talked about and how we solve them. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the platform system we made uh, and how we branded and how, we, how, it's, how it's working, basically, and then a few conclusions. But first, a bit about me. I used to be a Java developer uh, for many, many years. And I think the fact that I'm a developer going into the infrastructure space makes a difference. I've heard a lot about all the loads of the keynotes that talk about how we want to uh, start solving the developer's problem and then increase the development pace and make, make better de um, deployment pipelines. All of those things have been kind of my main goals for starting to work with infrastructure. It's not about, it's about increasing the pace and the development speed. So when I started to, when I had been a developer for like 10 years and had all this bitterness built up inside me, I thought I could use all those experiences and all that bitterness and try to solve the problems for all the other developers so they didn't have to have all the problems I've had. So I started to work with infrastructure and platforms. I started with Kafka. I operated Kafka a few years for my former company. And then I started the migration to Kubernetes. I presented something on KubeCon in Berlin this spring. Uh, then I worked for a company called Finn, which is one of the largest websites in Norway. It's a classified marketplace. And what I talked about then was how you can maintain continu continuous delivery whilst migrating to Kubernetes. And that's been a great success. Uh, right now, Finn has migrated about 60% of all their services to Kubernetes. And at least in Norwegian terms, it's loads of traffic. And before the migration, Finn had a really good speed, deployed to production a thousand times a week. And we managed to keep up that pace, even making it better. And the developers were very happy. But I thought that problem was kind of solved. I needed to find something more difficult than uh, just migrating Kubernetes in an, in an organization that had most of the stuff in place already. So I started to work for the government. Uh, and the Norwegian Labor and Welfare Administration was uh, created in 2006 when we merged two different organizations. Uh, and basically, it's got, it has offices all around Norway and people uh, the citizens of Norway, when they have problems, when they've lost their job, or when they're sick, or when they have kids, they can come into this office, or these offices and talk to the different people who work there and get help, basically. We have 50 different benefits. We pay out about a third of the national budget of Norway. Uh, one of the richest countries in the world is paid, paid out by this uh, agency. Unemployment benefits, pensions, child and parent benefits. 
There's 600 people working in this IT department. Two years ago, almost none of them were programmers. Uh, there was architects and developers and testers, and they only used consultants. And when you go back and think about uh, the, when I got to NAV, I thought this is really old and strange and difficult. And then I realized there's a history here. NAV got its first computer system in 1967. The database of that system still runs. It's a large 10 gigabyte uh, file. We built a new service on top of that, but we still use the database. It's in read-only mode now. It contains the salaries of people living in Norway from uh, like 67 and up till 2010, I think. And the big file is a bit difficult to handle, so there's this old lady. She comes in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. She was a part of the team that built that system, and she helps the team that's now trying to be like architect into this large 10 gigabyte file in a strange language they don't understand, and try to understand and fix, find all the data they need to get that data to use it for calculating pensions for Norwegian, Norwegians. That was the first system. And of course, we have mainframe systems. Those are still in use. Uh, we have this really strange Oracle Java thing, which was created around 2000, where the Java objects are, instances of those objects are in the database. It's not like an app server. So for the, for all the developers have to have their own Oracle database to do anything at all. That's still, in, mm, still running. Loads of IBM WebSphere, JEE applications. Most of those are still running. We have an IBM MQ um, message queue still running. Uh, last five, five to 10 years, we've been migrating to more modern stacks like JBoss and stuff. Most of our applications now are in JBoss. But we realized, uh, well, since we have all these other systems, we, what's the harm of introducing a few more? <laughs> so we started to work on Docker and Kubernetes. Oops, I forgot about the images. That's actually, uh, prod is Norwegian for production. This was the production system at some point in uh, NAV's history. And now we want to be, be somewhere around here. So, uh, NAV has had a private cloud for a few years based on um, VMware. It's kind of self-service where the developers go into different web apps and provision the stuff they need. They get VM, VMs for JBoss or VMs for uh, IBM WebSphere and or databases. And there's a really strict handover between developers and uh, ops guys. So the ops guys have, no, the developers have no access at all to production. And if, if there's an error in production, the uh, ops guys find it, and then they might call the developers, developers later. <laughs> at least until last year, there was a three month release cycle with a four week test period afterwards. And there was a set of testers and uh, release managers. The culture was a bit more like this. We had this really, really, really large development project uh, outsourced to consultants. And because that's scary, we built up a really, really, really large organization to specify and, um, and test those uh, projects created by the developers. So we had no developers, but we had architect testers and release managers. So as you can see, the challenge I wanted was bigger than the one I had before, where I just had to maintain continuous delivery whilst migrating to Kubernetes. Now we wanted to use Kubernetes and use everything to kind of change this organization and change all these technical difficulties. And the reason I wanted this is this guy. My boss is boss is boss is boss. His name is Tui Bern, and he's the, he's the CIO of NAV now. And he's a former developer, so he understands things. And he wants us to deliver twice the speed at half the price. <laughs> and we want to build autonomous teams, have continuous delivery, and have a you build it, you run it culture, so that we can have developers actually running their own applications. 
And we're quite inspired of what's happening here in the US with 18F and in the UK with GDS and Estonia actually, which is really good at uh, digitalizing their public sector. So what we created uh, now, to achieve this twice, twice the speed to half the price, there's loads of things you need to do. And I don't know half of those things, but I know how to uh, make platforms. So I wanted to use my experience to build a Kubernetes-based platform to try to change as much as possible. Changing the culture, increasing the development speed, and try to improve the application architecture at the same time. Uh, I was at a talk with uh, people from a German bank yesterday, and I, you talked about how you, you, you had kind of the same challenge, but you, I think you had the harder time constraints. So you, you needed to do this without improving the application architecture as much and without doing all other stuff. We don't have those time constraints, so we, we want to use this uh, opportunity for change to actually change more than just moving to the cloud. <laughs> so now I'm going to go through all the different problems we had and how we solved those using uh, different Kubernetes concepts. So a tiny uh, repetition. We're stuck on premise. We had too many test environments. Access control was a problem for developers. We had network zones and firewalls that uh, stopped almost any kind of development pace. We needed overview of our, of our dependencies that we could trust. We had band monitoring. It was difficult to create new applications. And we had loads of nightly batch jobs. So the first part, we're stuck in our own data centers. And because we're a government agency, we have loads of sensitive data. Uh, the things uh, similar to the witness protection programs, the addresses of those people are in our database. So we need to kind of protect our data a lot. So we can't just move them outside of Norway without having proper control. And there's no public cloud data centers in Norway, so we're kind of, we're stuck on premise basically. But then again, there's loads of stuff happening in the open source, or in the public cloud world, which we want to leverage. We want to be able to use all those serv service as a serv or product as a service, platforms as a service products that Amazon and Google and every everybody offers. Both because it will make us quicker and it will make everything cheaper. And I think, we think we can move at some point. The law says, as far as we know, that it's legal for us to move outside of Norway as long as we have encryption and everything in place. But the timeline of doing that is really long. Uh, if we want to migrate everything outside, it's going to take a long rewrite. And we can't migrate our mainframe systems, for instance. <laughs> so the solution to this, at least the start of the solution to this, is to use Kubernetes. Because when I speak to my developers, or the development, developers in the development teams, but what they need to do to be able to make an application run in a public cloud, and what they have to do to make the applications run in Kubernetes, at least the first 10 to 15 steps are exactly the same. So if we start by migrating applications to an on-premise Kubernetes solution, we can leverage the work they do then when we were allowed to move to a public cloud later. Also, we can mirror or replicate most of the cool things we want in the public cloud um, offerings in Kubernetes. We can have function as a service and hosted databases with the less operational cost for developers. And we can also leverage all the different cloud native technologies that exist around there for monitoring and service meshes and security. Ah, I forget all the animations I have. <laughs> and of course, uh, we can reduce cost. We have a really large, I think, now, which isn't really, Norway isn't the biggest country. Uh, so our, we have kind of a traffic limit of, we'll never have more than, at least we can, we can estimate our user, user growth quite good. We have approximately 5 million users now, and we'll have approximately 5 million users for quite a few years. Uh, unless there's some kind of war situation where Norway takes other countries, but I don't think that will happen. Uh, so 
instead we don't we don't it's more important for us to be able to run uh, our applications more efficiently than ha handle like large, large scale increases. So, to conclude, uh, moving to Kubernetes, at least to start, is the same as it's a good stepping stone to move to a public cloud, and we get loads of value early on in the process. <laughs> so, the next problem we had, we had too many test environments. More than 20 distinct test environments, loads of them with production data, which means some of the data of all the people in the witness protection programs that we really, really, really don't want anyone to see. Uh, and all those environments are difficult to coordinate. I think it's a loop, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, could be just a really long GIF. GIF, GIF. Uh, yeah, so we had all these test environments, and coordinating those is difficult. There's three or four people whose job it is just to make sure that we have control over which uh, versions of which services runs in which test environments. And we have some of the legacy systems. Can't, we can't have one copy of, of all the legacy systems in each test environment, so we have to kind of have some system to handle all that. And my... I think the reason we have all these test environments is because we have these really long release cycles. Because when we have three or to 400 developers each going to release something at the same time, four times every year, they need different, and they, it's difficult for them to integrate before that, so they need separate environments and then some kind of test period afterwards. So what did we do to solve this? Basically, uh, we created two Kubernetes clusters in our um, solution. Production and not production. And in uh, not production, we made it possible to create all these different uh, test environments using namespaces. But every time someone asked for a new test environment, we said no, at least twice. Uh, and then so they really had to have good reasons uh, to be able to do this. Uh, but of course, you can't just take away all those opportunities at once. You have, we want people to actually use the things we build as well. So we have to make it easy when they've described us that they really need this. So the automatic provisioning of these namespaces afterwards. Uh, the diagram is supposed to show how we have, there's many instances of many applications running in not production, but in production, there's only one of each. And then we're, uh, well, this makes it possible to create and test environments as namespaces as we need. We can have some isolation. We can have limits on the namespaces. But it's still easier to reduce afterwards. And we have some, we say no a bit, so that people think of why they need all these test environments. So the next problem was access control. This is more or less what it looked like when I left Norway on Monday morning. Uh, the access control in our old system was that basically it was either we had access to production or we had no, ac no access to production. And uh, the operations people had access and the developers didn't. And this kind of handover process where if you wanted to do anything in production, you had to get, you had to hand over your application to the um, operations people. That didn't really work and it created, uh, it, introduced, no, it took away a lot of the trust between the different um, departments. So what we then wanted to do, what we basically wanted to do was to reduce the distance between the people who caused the pain and the people who had the pain, because now the distance was very much the developers made errors, but they didn't really feel the pain of those errors. That was done by the operations people. So we wanted to let the developers feel all the errors, they, all the pain they've created themselves. But then we had to make it possible for them to get access to production. But we couldn't give them access to everything because we have sensitive data and we need some kind of control. So we implemented the OpenID uh, Connect uh, system, where we have an Azure AD Active Directory, which is have all the IDs of all our developers. And then we just used the Kubernetes 
namespaces to say that the development teams all have access to the, um, stuff in their own um, their own applications. <laughs> so network zones. We had loads. So we had three or four different network zones, and we had a firewall between them, which wasn't which was uh, handled by the uh, operated on manually, which made it. Um, when you have that for 10, 15 years, there really is no control anymore. You just have loads of holes in the firewall and you don't really know where they are. And it's difficult and slow to create new, to open for applications. So basically what we want to do is to automate all this stuff. And we want to do this by using network policies. And we do this by using network policies in Kubernetes. So then when we have namespaces for each of the different teams, we can basically, in a declarative and fully automated way, just recreate all the actual rules from the firewalls and have the necessary, necessary isolation between the different uh, teams' applications. And we also look at Spiffy and Sire and all the new cool stuff I learned about the last few days to, in oops, to increase this even further. Also, we had the, all these architects, and architects like to draw, likes to draw diagrams of boxes and arrows and how everything fits together. The problem is, of course, that it's difficult to do that in a <coughs> correct manner. Most of the time, they do it either development time or deployment time. They talk to developers, or they try to, they try to do some static code analysis to see who talks to who. And that's never correct. Normally, this ends up in uh, confluence pages that no one looks at because there is really no value of having an incorrect diagram like this. And what we want to do here is to introduce Istio, because Istio, along with a lot of the other stuff we can do, makes it possible to see a real-time, absolutely correct image of who talks to who. And then we have this, uh, and then we have these diagrams showing the, actually, the traffic patterns, and we can easily add loads of stuff to, onto that diagram, like if anything is slow and how much traffic there is, and uh, stuff like that. And when we use open tracing, we could probably also do this for our asynchronous communication. <laughs> so the next problem we had was monitoring. The monitoring solutions we had were mostly made for the operations people and the bosses, because those are the ones who are scared, or those are the ones who's head around the block when something goes down. And that means you had a separate team trying to create um, monitoring solutions, and they didn't really talk to the developers at all. There were more uses of uh, logs than metrics, and most of the monitoring was on the infrastructure side, not on the service side. <laughs> so here we basically did, quite simply, we introduced Prometheus as a, a metrics database and then a metrics collection system. And using the Kubernetes method, when you collect data f using Prometheus uh, on Kubernetes, you get all the metadata from the deployments on the time series. And that, specific, that, that data makes it possible to create like generic dashboards like the one you can see here, which is actually shows data for any uh, application running in your cluster, but you can drill down and see only data for one. So we created this Grafana dashboard, which has shows the, the generic information, but a dropdown with, with applications running, with all the applications running. So as soon as you deploy an application to our cluster, you can go to the Grafana dashboard and just pick your application and in your environment and in your cluster uh, for, on Grafana and see all the data. And we used the default exports for Prometheus, so we can have JVM stats and node stats and stuff like that. And the uh, CPU and memory data comes from Heapster. And we can even, using this data, quite easily create some kind of billing solution where we measure the uh, resource utilization for each of the different systems, because they're all reported in exactly the same way. So we can create a, a billing dashboard saying 
basically introducing something we haven't had before, that the development team have to take into consideration the cost of what they're creating. <laughs> so, uh, the next problem. Uh, it was difficult to create new apps. I talked a bit earlier about the old kind of private cloud they had where all the provisioning was done manually in web applications, which were homemade. So we had to go to some systems to create the VMs and create the applications and create the databases, and other systems to create configurations for the different applications. And to actually deploy, you had to create a ticket in Jira, and the ops people did the deployment. So we created something, we created a separate application here called a nice deployment daemon. It is a Go application running inside the Kubernetes cluster. And when you want to deploy an application, you do an HTTP post to that endpoint with some... Um, the file you can see on the side there is all the different things you can um, configure, but there's loads of sensible defaults, and we created this specifically for NAV. So normally there's like 10 to 15, no, 5 to 10 lines of YAML for an application just saying what you, what you need. And then, uh, <laughs> then this uh, nice deployment daemon fetches this uh, file and the Docker container and deploys it. And the fact that we use Go as, and have created this application ourselves makes it possible for us to tailor this specifically to our needs for deploying an application. So we can use this to integrate with some of the older systems like the system we have for application configuration has an API as well as a web, web um, GUI. So we can reuse all the application configuration and makes it, that makes it much easier to, to migrate applications to our new system. And then when we're done and we have a majority of this uh, applications inside our cluster, we can try to reduce some of those uh, need for those uh, configurations. <laughs> and this also integrates with all the different other systems we have. So we can say, this says, this turns on Prometheus if the application exposes Prometheus metrics, and it handles everything. And there's been loads of discussions, uh, I think this week, about how to reduce the amount of YAML you need. And I've seen loads of systems that kind of generates YAML into Git repositories and then do kubectl. I say kubectl, even though Brian Grant said something else. Uh, apply. But I like this approach much better, because this makes it possible to have everything inside the repository of the application. We have this file together with the application files and the Docker file. And one of the things I like about this is that then it's not my responsibility. When it's inside the developer's Git repository, it's a developer's responsibility. And it's them who owns the application and all the configuration needed. And we get the same um, advantages with the uh, git commit log and everything for all the changes. So the nice deploy daemon takes this information and transforms that into uh, Kubernetes um, um, uh, resources. <laughs> so batch jobs. Uh, because of our old architecture, we, we normally run batch jobs at night. Uh, and running batch jobs at night is it's bad in many, many ways. Uh, first of all, someone has to be up at night and to check that everything goes okay. And probably the developers work it in, in days, so there has to be a separate team of people who run all the batch jobs. And they don't understand the batch jobs because they haven't been part of the development team. And there's resource contention. And there's, it's difficult to scale because we normally also put our batch jobs inside the application instances. So a batch job is just calling an endpoint in the application. And then you can't do that during the day because that's when the users use our systems. So instead, we try to introduce batch jobs as a concept in NICE, where we have a separate file, NICE job YAML file, and we have the batch jobs as separate containers. And again, this is the same kind of um, thought processes as behind the NICE YAML file, where we have sensible defaults and try to reduce the amount of YAML any developer has to write. So now I'm going to, that was kind of the uh, solutions and problems we had. I'm just going to spend a few minutes, talk a bit more about NICE. <laughs> uh, 
this is kind of the architecture I think I talked most about. We try to layer it so that it's possible to run on many different platforms. We have the applications on top, and then we have what we call the platform applications, which is stuff like Rook and Istio and Grafana and Prometheus, and a few operators, mostly written in Go, running inside the cluster doing stuff. And the fact that we base all this on the Kubernetes APIs makes it possible for us, as I said before, to run on-premise now and migrate this to different uh, cloud providers later. Right from the start, we focused a lot on continuous delivery of all we do. So we have a pipeline that deploys the cluster. Uh, we use Ansible and Jenkins to that. So when we do a change, it's more or less automatically propagated into the cluster. And we have the same for the platform applications. We use uh, Helm for those, because then we can leverage all the stuff in uh, the Helm stable repositories. And we use a small open source tool called Landscaper, which makes it possible to do continuous delivery of Helm, um, Helm charts. And as I've not, this is my second, second go at migrating a large system into Kubernetes. And I realized that creating the platform it's so much easier than migrating the applications. Uh, probably because we want to uh, increase the quality whilst we do this, but just writing an app and platform would take us a lot less if we didn't have to tailor it to the fact that we had to migrate applications. So the platform we want to build, that's going to be the next step when we migrate with most of the stuff, we can try to create the perfect application, uh, the perfect platform if you're still there, of course. And the fact that we can reuse parts of the private cloud and makes it much easier to migrate. For storage, we just started to use Rook IO, and that works really well. It's, I've heard rumors that it's going to be a CNCF uh, hosted project really soon. And it's, I always thought setting up like distributed storage was, was difficult and scary, but using Rook makes this incredibly easy. We also want to offer Postgres uh, using the Postgres operator. Then we can move away from our old Oracle uh, uh, stack. We open sourced everything. Not necessarily because we think anyone can reuse what we do, but because we're a tax-funded government agency, we think what we do should be open and public because it's basically the uh, our interpretation of some laws. And having the open source model also works really well internally. I normally uh, give cake to anyone outside my team who creates pull requests into NICE. And cake works really well to get people to do stuff for you. Uh, I've had loads of success with that over many years. At Finn, I managed the whole organization to change do weeks of work just because I promised them cake. And any team that migrates an application to NICE and gets proper traffic in production gets cake. And it works because it creates enthusiasm and it creates visibility. <laughs> so, a few conclusions. I think Kubernetes is a really good product also to kind of create platforms that shape and cultures and organizations because it's, it's kind of an implementation of continuous delivery, I think. It helps, it makes, makes it easier for us to deliver and all the things we need, the teams want us to do, we can deliver quickly because of Kubernetes. When you do something like this, it's much more important to focus on the migration of the applications than creating the platforms because that's where you're going to spend most of your time. Building a brand like NICE and giving out cake and creating this internal open source enthusiasm really helps because then people, I've never asked in both my two projects doing this, I've never asked anyone to migrate to our applications. They just, they come knocking on the door straight away when, it's, when we start to talk about what we have. <laughs> and lastly, if you want to build a ability run it culture where the developers do the most of their operations themselves, Kubernetes gives you loads of good tools for that and it also reduces the amount of work you have to do. If you're ever in Oslo and Norway and have anything you want to share in the cloud native space, I run the cloud native uh, foundation meetup in Oslo. So you can contact me. Questions?
Mm. Describe maybe what the culture was before Kubernetes and then after and then like where the pain points were and how you would handle those. Yeah, well, I think it's difficult to describe culture, <laughs> but I think lack of trust was a really good uh, uh, word for it. When we started this journey, the first kind of, not explosion, but the first kind of thing that happened was when developers wanted access to production. Because the ops guys didn't want to do that, but that's what we wanted to achieve. And that's kind of the first thing where we saw that we had to change the culture. And we managed to kind of do, we managed to create some kind of system where we have them ops guys, because a lot of our developers haven't really got too much experience with running stuff in production either. So we need to train them as well. And we try to help make the ops guys help with that. So, and also we need to start small. You can't just put the most important thing in production right away, you have to build trust and people have to see that this will work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Find kind of a portability of concepts between All the mainframe developers keep telling me that. <laughs> we had this 50 years ago, they say. <laughs> and of course, some of it is true. They have like this shared, the, the pool of resources and how they use it is very similar. And they even had all the building stuff made. when I. When I started to say, oh, we can make building with this, they just start laughing because they had this, this was kind of built into the system from the start. So, it, so obviously concepts are similar, but this is on data center level. So it's, this, it's dif different what you can achieve, I think. Yeah. When you, Rook sets up Ceph in a way that handles persistent volume claims and everything. Uh, no, but we haven't, not too long. This is, it was, it was the last slide I made basically because I'm coming here. <laughs> we have a few apps using it, but uh, the main guy who did the work says it's, at least it's easy. Let's see if it works as well, but uh, yeah, Ceph works. And, I remember from Berlin, the Rook people say, well, Rook is just for setting up Ceph. It's not on the data path. Then it's just normal Ceph. Yeah? Sorry? Docker. Docker? Yeah. No. Uh, I kind of want to, but I never had anyone tell me they've done that successfully yet. Loads of pushback. Uh, but I think we're not done here. We're kind of, we know where we want to and we, we've done some of it, but we know, oh, sorry, she said stop. <laughs> I'll just finish. We know this is going to take years because some of the systems has to be rewritten from scratch. There's no, and that's some of our core systems. So a lot of the old processes will be there for many years. Thank you. <laughs>